introduce Dr. Will Bateman from C-Cell. Will is a serial entrepreneur and a very well credentialed man. He's going to address the issues of uh, the ocean's challenges we face with a unique perspective. Originally coming from a company doing uh, marine renewable energy, he's now done more work moving into uh, cultivated reefs and digital reefs. So Will, I'll hand it over to you, it's all yours. Right. Um, hello, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, it's an early morning here in England. So thank you for that introduction. Um, right. So um, just to again introduce um, CSAL, um, myself, Howard and um, Andrew Kant are sort of uh, running run, run CSAL. Howard's our chairman and Andrew Kant's our CFO. We have um, a sort of range of operations. Um, we're mostly based in the UK, but we have um, two of my team are actually in Madrid in, in Spain, and the rest of my team is in um, um, in Cancun in Mexico, which is mostly where we do a lot of our um, development and testing. And we've fortunately, you might have seen us in the press in a right variety of sort of forms, but for example, we were recently picked out to be in the um, by PwC to be part of their net zero top 50 ones to watch. Um, we're, we're pretty happy with um, some of the press that we've picked up on. So our mission as a company is to, if I just read this out, is to combat coastal erosion by working with nature to restore a sustainable balance to coastal environments and bring lasting protection to communities around the world. Now that's quite an, you know, encompassing, but what does that actually involve from our, our side? So. We are developing a what we've been turning calling internally a digital reef, and what we're going to be turning call what we will moving into calling a living reef, and it really comp comprises of sort of four main um, elements. The first is um, harnessing renewable power, and like ev everybody else, we will use solar where it's appropriate or wind, but we've also developed our own um, wave energy device. Um, the second part of it is uh, around um, the actual structures that we place out in the ocean and in particular the electrolysis that sorry the electronics and the elect to drive a process called um, um, well, to drive an electrolytic process to form rock around a, a structure which brings me to the, the actual structure itself and the, the final element is what we're really, really developing over the next two years um, is around um, working much more closely with things like corals, oysters and seagrass and I'll, I'll touch on all of these points as we go through. So to kick off, um, really what is the problem that we are seeking to address? Now if you tap into Google beach erosion you will get um, something like 41 million res um, search results coming back and beach um, Beach or coastal erosion is something that is very prevalent in almost every coastal country around the world, um, particularly in, you know, certainly in the UK in places like East, East Anglia. Um, I've just come back from Israel where they've got a, a very serious problem. So 45 kilometres of the 125 kilometres of their coastline are, 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 are classed as sort of seriously eroding. And where we're working in, in places like Mexico, there they have beaches that have, have um, um, retarded uh, at an incredible rate, sort of one to two uh, metres a year. And this is where I first sort of witnessed this. So this is a the picture on the left here is is um, from the Hyatt Hotel, pro probably to remain nameless, but it, you know, but this is in Playa del Carmen, where which is on the eastern coast of, of um, the Yucatan in Mexico. And Playa del Carmen um, is a playa means beach in Spanish and this if you went back about 20 years there was virtually no development in this region and as a result of their fantastic beaches hotels are flooded in so you've now got you know huge resorts running all the way up that coastline and in about 2017 things were not perhaps as good as they were but they were okay and in the space of about two to three years they've seen um, their beaches re um, reduced significantly. So when I was there in 2019 and I put a drone up, um, you literally had one to two meters of sand in front of the of the hotel and they were shoring it up with sandbags um, to prevent prevent even further erosion into the building itself. Now, 
the rationale for why that is happening, um, there, there are a combination of factors, but the, the, the most, from an environmental perspective, the thing that's changed the most is actually the wave environment. And uh, this isn't work that we did, but uh, Miami University did, uh, and a few others did a, a fantastic um, paper and they had looked at the change in the wave climate over the last, I think it was 35 years, and noticed that on average across the globe, due to climate change, um, we are seeing a 0.41% increase in wave intensity year on year. Now that of course is not uniform, there are areas where actually the waves are getting smaller, but there are more often than not areas where the, the waves are increasing in strength. And in places like the, the Yucatan where we're working in Mexico, um, it is going up in, um, by about 1-2% to 2 per year. Now in, on, it, on its own, that's not much, but you, when you accumulate that over 10 or 20 years, that can then uh, that can align with a sort of 10, 20, or even a 40% increase in wave energy, and that's significant. Um, the other factors that are, are also causing erosion or ch causing changes in, in the beach profile are often human activity. So people have built harbors or marinas which are changing the flow of um, sand around around the coastline, and I'll come I'll come on to that in a bit a bit more. Now, overall, we estimate that about 51% of sandy beaches around the around the world are seeing increased erosion. So, sorry, that's 51% of populated sandy beaches around around the world are seeing increased erosion. Um, there's about 18% where the the beaches are, are just you know in a stable state and not really doing anything, and there's about 30% of beaches that are actually increasing in size. So what we're we're seeing is um, certainly a, a loss of sand overall, but you're also seeing um, and, and this has always happened. You thought you're seeing areas where beaches are sediment is moving from one area into another. Um, so that's natural. What's changed due to the increased um, climate is this. Um, shift away from um, beaches that are creating to being far more beaches that are being eroded. So the UN reckons that we need to spend something in the order of 120 billion per annum to fix all of this um, and that's that's for all coastlines and that's also considering sort of sea level rise um, and that's 120 billion per year up until the end of this century. So it's a huge number. We think that number's a bit a bit on the high side. Um, our own estimates come in at about 50 billion, but either way it's a, it's a large challenge and it's a, a big problem. Now to think about what's actually fundamentally going on, and this comes back and sort of touches back on my own sort of um, expertise. So I did a, a PhD in, in numerical, um, like in, in extreme ocean waves. So um, if you actually dive in and look at what actually are, are the waves are doing, smaller waves are actually genuinely good for a beach. So when they, they not only do they help to sort of circulate the, um, the water um, on the beach and keep it healthy, but when those waves break, you get this small jet of water actually rushing up the, up the sand and actually pushes sand ahead of it and it helps to build up sand on, on your beaches. Now, so they're, they're a good thing to have. Larger waves, as I'm, as I'm sure you know, you, you'll have seen from you know films and things like Hawaii Five-O, where you've got you know huge waves breaking onto on, onto the coast. They it, when they meet um, shorelines which haven't experienced those waves before, and you've got a lot of sort of sediment or, or softer or sands. Um, those bigger waves will break up that material and just tear it away. Now, that in itself is not an issue. If you know those those waves come in and, and break up a, a break up the land and that sediment is, is kept in suspension close to land then you know when 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 times change the waves climate reduces those smaller waves can bring that material back in and arguably you know you can you, the beach will will change of course across the year or you know shrink and grow but it you know it's hopefully fairly stable the the second thing that waves do as they come into land um, is that you're actually moving water due to the sort of the non-linearity of, of, of how the waves move and the water within them. They're actually physically moving water towards the beach. Now, clearly that can't um, can, can, can't persist forever because you'd end up with all of the ocean on, on, on the beach or on the land. So what you find is actually the water is very, very slightly higher closer to the beach than it is out at sea. And that then creates uh, a current, just like a river running down a, downstream. So that creates a current that runs back out, out to sea. 
Now the the um, sorry the the easiest um, example of that. I mean, if you if you if you swim a lot, you may have heard of rip currents, and they are you know extremely dangerous because when you have a sort of a sort of horseshoe type bay, you have these rips currents coming out, and, and if you get trapped in one of those and, you, and you're trying to swim directly towards shore, you can end up swimming forever. Where you have um, coastlines which are sort of flatter and the waves are coming in at a, say at an angle, and this is this is for the Yucatan in Mexico on the northern northern Yucatan, um, these currents actually run along along the shore. So once you've had those big waves come in and break up the the sediment on the shoreline, these currents can then actually then pick that material up and transport it away. And when you see now. The other thing I've just added on here is you've got um, rivers coming in. So rivers are a fantastic source of extra sediment onto the beaches. And but but where you see man-made constructions where they've built a harbour or they've changed that profile of the land, that can also lead to um, quite severe unintended consequences further downstream because what you're doing is you're diverting those currents that run along the, along the shore. And what we're seeing with climate change is some of those currents are actually now going out into deeper water. So they're taking sediment that would otherwise have just put moved along the shoreline, uh, they're taking out into deep water where it's then lost forever. And as a result, we've seen that shift from a sort of fairly balanced, um, balance, fairly equal balance between beaches are accreting and, and eroding um, to more beaches being um, eroded because we're losing a lot of that sand into, into deeper water. Now, um, and I mean, I'm, so it's just, just to reiterate the whole rip current piece, okay? So they're very, sim they're very similar processes. Now, the analogy that I like to use um, in sort of just to put this in a, in a different sort of context, if I wanted to move that building, it would be virtually impossible in, as, as, as an entirety. But if I bring in a digger and break it up into lots of small pieces, I can move that wheelbarrow. So I can move that building with a wheelbarrow, okay? You know, it may be a lot of trips, but I can reduce it into a series of small items and move it around. The ocean is doing exactly the same. So there's waves come in, they break up our coastline, they break up even buildings, and then it's those currents that then move it very gently um, to somewhere else. Now, how do you actually come up with a solution to this? So as with so many things, nature has, has had millions of years to perfect this and has figured out, uh, 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 in, in, or has evolved to develop um, a solution, and that is coral reefs. So coral reefs already protect around 200 million people um, around the world. Islands like the Maldives simply wouldn't exist if it wasn't for them. And even if you look closely along the coastlines and say the Yucatan, where the land sort of protrudes out, you can often see a coral reef further out to sea, and where you see these sort of horseshoe bays being uh, arising or erosion arising is often because they don't have a, um, a reef um, to, the, to their east. Now, what reefs do is they are, you know, they're, they're lumps below the surface, and what they do is when those waves come in from from out to sea, they they get um, the energy gets compressed up towards the surface um, in the in the first instance, which causes those waves to steepen and often de um, become unstable. So they then break, and once they break, they create an awful lot of turbulence and lose energy. The other thing is just the inherent roughness of the of the reef will also take out a little bit of energy from from those waves. Now. What's crucial to remember here is the, the reefs are not taking on the waves flat, full on. You know, if you try to stop the crest of a wave, it's moving very fast. There's an awful lot of power in that. Um, and for you know, the mariners I know on this call, you know, you'll have experienced that when it crashes against a ship. You know, huge amount of power. What waves uh, reefs are doing is a little bit more subtle. They're working below the sur surface to uh, affect a change. And the analogy that I like to use is if, if a large large person is running towards you. To try and stop them is, is difficult, but if you can trip them up, they will stop themselves. And that's what we're tr we want to try to replicate with, with the, the reefs. Now, the other important feature of these is as that those bigger waves are coming in, before they reach the reef, they are lifting up material, they're getting, you know, they're moving sediment into suspension. And as they move across the reef, they lose energy. So their ability to carry stuff um, reduces. So that sediment ends up dropping and forming, um, you know, depositing sand closer to shore. And that's that's a very, you know, again, to go back to the Maldives, Maldives in many ways is just, you know, some of those islands are just one big sand bank because that sand's just come in and it's just slowly accumulated over time. Now, 
we love coral reefs, but as we all know, coral reefs are in decline and um, we've lost already about 50% of um, the world's coral reefs. Now, the fact that they've died doesn't necessarily mean that they've they've stopped being a, a, as, a, as a, a barrier, but they're certainly not as effective and they're certainly not going to continue to evolve with time um, if, the, if, they, if they're dead. So a secondary or, you know, in some ways, the primary purpose of what we want to do in CSAL is to help to revitalize um, coral reefs, but also to bring coral reefs back into areas which weren't otherwise weren't previously there so that we can provide the coastal protection that we sorely need. So the CSAL as a company and as, as our sort of solution, um, I've already shown you an overview pre previously, but we, we have a number of sort of tranches to what we do. The first is, is around modelling. It's really, really important to understand what is what you are, you know, what the marine you know, environment is doing, particularly around coastal um, morphology. You know, how are those currents moving? What are the waves doing? Um, how are you actually going to affect a positive change? Crucially, we don't want to make sh we want to make sure that anything we do doesn't make things worse um, than, than than it currently is, um, i.e., by having unintended consequences further downstream. The other piece that we, and this really goes back to our earlier history, I don't know if this video is going to play, but it's around um, modelling of our, our wave energy device. So this is something that we've um, we've been developing for a number of years. It has a huge amount of um, investment from the UK has gone into this. Um, but it, again, it's a, a way for us to rapidly prototype um, our paddle, look at it operating in different wave conditions and environments, and, um, and you know, in, you know, optimize the design. The the second sort of tranche to the, to the business is is the actual physical system. So in in the first instance, it's the reef that we're installing, and um, as I've mentioned, the electronics. And it, through the combination of while well, using the electronics with those reefs, we then use uh, we actually grow rock around the structure, and I'll, I'll show you some pictures of this later. And of course, having designed a wave paddle, we've actually then got we've 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 got a physical. We've, well, we've been building the physical paddles, and we've had pilots of pilots installed in in Cosmo. And the third part, which is still evolving, so that the bottom right-hand corner here is actually not something that we we yet do. Um, well, at least we don't do it in the field. We've just we've got it working in the lab. Um, is around the sort of remote monitoring. So all of our reefs and our paddles are all interconnected back, you know, like like Amazon Alexa's back to the onto the internet and we can control and monitor directly from here in the UK. And whilst initially that is essential for us, we can make sure that the equipment that we've installed, so the, the, the systems that we've installed to actually grow the rock, etc., are working correctly and we can tune those parameters or tune the way that is happening dynamically um, depending on you know, as our other research is that's ongoing, as we as we learn more about rock growth, for example, in the lab, we can apply what we're learning directly into the field. Um, the the future of this is also to actually make these um, boxes, as I said, a bit like Amazon Alexa's, so you can connect it into, you can connect other sensors onto that. And a simple example here is um, with with cameras. Um, but we're also going to be doing acoustics and, you know, measuring water temperatures and pollution. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on this more in a little bit. So, as I mentioned, the modelling for the coastal the coastal perspective, there's really sort of four main sections to this. First is, is actually looking at the waves. How do those waves come in? How do they refract as they come closer to the shore? Um, we will typically look back about over about sort of 20 to 30 years of wave history. So we build up a really comprehensive understanding of what's gone what's happened previously and then we will try to from that to extrapolate what we think is going to happen going forward. Um, I've already mentioned this sort of the these wave induced currents and how they flow as I said it's crucial. Um, these the final part is on 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 the on the on the on this is is really around um, looking at where do we place our reefs to achieve the optimal impact on, on the coastline and how the the how we expect the shoreline to evolve it's also the hardest part that we can do so i often say that i don't think we have anything anything more accurate than maybe 50 to 60 percent 
Um, as we get more data, we'll hopefully be able to refine things, but the problem is that every site is very different. The, everything from the grain of sands to the rocks to the profile of the shoreline can all have an impact. So it's actually extremely difficult to do, but what we can at least say is we think that A will be better than B, and we, you know, we can do that sort of A-B testing. Um, from both the wave panel and also from the reef perspective, we also do an awful lot of what we call CFD modeling. Um, so we're looking at how the waves interact with those structures. And um, in, in this instance, how, how we, that, that, that reef is causing those waves to break and dissipate energy. Now, the reef structure itself has, it looks simple, and I would argue all well-designed things are seem simple but it took a while to actually get that to to this point um we we wanted something that was very manufacturable um, we need to be installing i mean hopefully over the next year we'll be installing something like 600 uh, meters sorry 600 meters of reef as we progress forward as a company we want to be installing kilometers every year so we need to be in a capability to actually manufacture these at scale um alongside that we need it to be stackable so you've got these these almost um um, so, you know, this is a secondary requirement in the sense that you've got to, if you, having made them, you've got to better get them onto a, a lorry and ship them around the world, and you don't want to be moving air. So, it's how can you pack these things in tight, as tight as possible so they're actually transportable in an efficient way? But at the same time, the units have also got to be able to withstand not only the, the, the growth of the rock over a, a long period of time and ultimately the oysters and corals and everything else attached to them, but also those extreme waves that we would expect in, say, 40 or every 40 or 100 years. Um, the electronics, again, just to show a different perspective on this, but the, you know, we, we have mentioned, you know, we've spent a lot of time around, around um, the design of these, in particular, how do we how do we actually install in installing any any anything in the ocean is difficult. Installing power or electronics in the ocean is particularly difficult, and you know, we've had lots of issues with connectors, etc. But it's um you know a huge amount of work going on there, and looking at sort of accelerated testing to ensure that these units can actually perform as we want over a period of time, and then we get into the sort of the remote monitoring side of it. And something we're particularly keen on is um, what we call power balancing. So if you've got energy coming from a variety of different sources, it could be, as I said, wave, wind or, or solar, how can you use that energy eff effectively within the reef? So if you use solar as a, as, a, as a sort of an example, you don't have any energy at night, you have, but you do have power during the day. Um, and that power will change. If a cloud comes over, it will change. So how can we be smart about how we use that power um, to ensure the, the reef grows evenly? And what we do is you know, simply we can turn power on, on and off to different parts of the, of the reef out, out, as we want. Um, there are some secondary uh, chemical consequences of doing that. So a lot of the research we do on that is how to how to overcome those issues to ensure that we can we can ensure so to ensure that the rock grows consistently. The other thing that I'm we, we aren't yet doing, but I, I'm keen on is to in, enhance this so we can actually smooth out microgrids. So one of the challenges of um, particularly in small coastal communities is they often get spikes of power from you know, when when people suddenly you know other people turn off their equipment or turn something on, and we think we can react fast enough and we can therefore take spikes of power out of the grid and put them into the reef. And equally, if they suddenly have a, a, um, um, a drop in the voltage, we can turn the reef off so we can put, we can, you know, re reduce the load on, on, on the grid at a, at a fairly rapid rate. So, help, so fundamentally helping to sort of smooth out the power supply. And the central control unit is just a picture, but as I, as I mentioned, is it's connected into the internet, and we can we can remotely connect and control all of our systems at, at any time. Um, a big part of what we now do, in fact, Lola's entire job is around this, is is actually around the rock growth. And just to give you two examples of this, these are electron microscope scope images of the rock that's, um, that we form, and there's. Um, um, there's two main ones that we're, we're developing or producing on the reef. One is called brucite, which is very high in magnesium. Um, there's about four to five times more magnesium in the ocean than there is calcium carbonate. And 
We actually want calcium carbonate ultimately, but when you do the electrolysis, uh, magnesium tends to be um, more, more prolific, but it's that's actually good because the, the, the magnesium um, creates a it creates a softer rock, but it also creates something that's actually porous, so it allows the electrolysis that we're doing to continue. The other rock that we want um, is aragonite, and this is really hard. So this is this can be harder um, we, over time. This can be as hard or even harder than normal sort of concrete, and it's very high in calcium. And we are we are the work we do. We actually grow a blend of these two. And depending on what we're doing, depending on the, the, the time of the day, we will grow more of one or, or, or another to actually um, ensure that we get the bulk that we want at the, the appropriate um, and the appropriate strength. But with time, ultimately, we want everything to be um, aragonite or, or a strong, a higher blend of, of aragonite. Now, to come back to the, the other section of, of, of what we um, actually the way I started and this is kind of like a sort of his, historical progress of the company so from 2012 when I had simply a concept and you know this is when I went to University College London and said look I, I've got an idea for a, a, a curved wave paddle um, can you can you help me to just sort of explore this um, and Fundamentally, all I really did is I looked at the time at what other people were doing, and, I, and for those, um, I've got a picture later on. But um, most most paddles at that time were either sort of points point absorbers, like buoys that you see, you know, you often see around the ocean that sort of bounce up and down and were generating power, or they were these large flaps which were flat and they were um, pivoted on the base and going backwards and forwards. And I just questioned why they were flat, knowing a reasonable amount about the ocean and the way energy moves through the ocean. Energy moves effectively in a in a in a, in a it's unidirectional, um, although the particle, the wave orbits are are circular. Yeah, but that's the the so the water is actually moving in little circles. Is that the energy below which is carried by those waves is actually moving in in one direction? Um, well. It's a multitude of directions, but if you take any single sort of point, you've got a you've got a, a dominant direction. So I question, well, given that, why are we therefore creating these symmetric devices? Why aren't they curved? And we went through a, a variety of tests, and from that very early trial, we realised that just by putting a simple curvature to the paddle, we managed to increase the the, the motion of the device um, with a, a fixed um, resistance by about 40 percent. As we progressed through this, we were actually able to increase the, the power output by about two to three times relative to a, a flat um, your flat equivalent. And the other advantage of a curve is that it gives, um, it's a bit like picking up a pizza. If you if you try to pick up a pizza and it's flat, it just flops over and you know, drops onto the floor, or at least the toppings do. But if you put a curve into it, um, you can you know you kink it in the middle, you can pick it up. So not only we increased the power, but we were able to also reduce the weight of this system by about um, I think 85%. Um, um, and on top of that, we also moved into using um, composite materials. So as we progressed through here, we went through a variety of different designs. I mean, this 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 one in 2015 was actually a actually a terrible design. It was made from steel, and the shape was because we were using steel was actually very difficult to manufacture what we wanted. So we ended up with a, a design we didn't particularly like, and we then subsequently moved into composites, and um, which led to a pilot being installed in 20, 2018. Now. The paddle development, um, there's, a, there's, there's a little bit more we then, sorry, so, so just again go over this history. So this is, uh, you know, some images of some of the lab testing we did, again, at different scales, um, a variety of different concepts we were looking at. And ultimately, this has ended up in with the system. So we have um, three of these actually manufactured and waiting to be deployed in Mexico. Um, we, but we haven't taken it, you know, the, the next step. So the issue with our wave paddle in a, in a, in a word is that is the controllability. When you have a, a wave crest come in, it has more power in it than the trough. So the, the paddle itself ends up um, gradually moving further and further towards the shoreline shore. So the, the, the curve here is facing out to ocean on the, on the other side of the, you know, the, the, so the, con, the concave side is pointing out to the ocean, the convex side is pointing towards the shore. So you have to dynamically control this system. 
um, in order to ensure that the paddle remains in its sort of optimal position. You also want to be monitoring the waves coming in. So when you have a, a very large wave, you actually relax the system, you let, you let it move more freely. Um, and then the rest of the time you are um, increasing its resistance to hold it in, in its perfect, you know, to maximize the power output. Um, if you, if, but that control is very similar to the control I talked about for the microgrids. So, what we want to, so every, all of the electronics we've been designing around our, our, our reef is, has been designed in a way so that we can actually then connect it back into the wave paddle so we can actually effectively increase or reduce the resistance that the reef is providing to provide the control back to the to the wave paddle that we that we desire. Now there are other ways of doing it, but this is what we think will be the most efficient approach to to take in, in that regard. Um, and hopefully within the next sort of six months, we should be in a situation where we can actually then start to you know marry these two things two systems together and see how they go. Now, to put this in context, um, in terms of the com sort of competitor analysis around wave energy, when when I started, I mean, Aquamarine have now ceased to exist. Um, they, they went into receivership, I think, in about 2014. Um, so they had this huge system. Um, it's a uh, flap. It was installed up in Orkney in, in Scotland. And as I said, it moves backwards and forwards and generates power. They Their rated power for this system was about 800 kilowatts. We are orders of magnitude smaller than that. So our rated power is is for 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 what we were installing in Cosmo. And this does change, of course, to depending on how how wavy the environment you're going into is, is only about three kilowatts. So we're, we're significantly smaller. Yeah. Um, but if you actually then look at the other metrics, something quite interesting happened. So we are, you know, their system weighed in at least sort of 600 tons. Um, our entire paddle was about 310 ki kilograms. Um, they were quoting a cost to, you know, I think this is just sort of a, um, a cost to manufacture and install of about 12 million. Um, we think we can get this in, in a, actually under 10,000. So the last system we installed was, was around about 10 grand. Um, in terms of the actual parts that are going into this, I think we, we are probably about 40% lower than that um, ultimately. So whilst we are smaller in power, um, we have absolutely trashed the competition in terms of the crit critical metrics around the, the, sort of the weight and ultimately the cost of the system. And that plays into really what we wanted. We, I personally don't see um, wave energy being used at a sort of grid scale, um, for, so like a for like national grid scale. It's much more appropriate for, for islands or smaller nations or where you've got sort of microgrids. Um, and it's particularly good for situations where we, where like our reef, for example, where you need power at sea. And our general rule of thumb is that if, if we are more than about sort of 300 meters from the coast, um, we would suggest you would, uh, and, and you've got a wavy environment, I would suggest you look at our using our wave paddle. If you're closer to that at the moment, I would suggest you use um, solar energy j just p because of the economics. And it's very difficult for us to compete directly with solar energy in that sort of near shore zone because the, you know, the solar industry has progressed so incredibly in, in the last you know, decade, I, I guess, and the costs have come, come way down. So a lot of the installations we've been we've installed on our reef, we've actually relied on solar panels because we, we at least know that we can rely on that is working and we're not adding another layer of complication. As I said, as we go through this next year, it's going to be great to see if we can get the, the paddle back out. Now, um, I'm just going to touch on a couple of sort of example installations. I've talked about um, the Yucatan, um, just to for those who are, who are lost as to where I was. Um, this is the Yucatan Peninsula, and it's it's on the eastern side of Mexico. And these little pins show where we've got our existing installations. So the the first is um, on on um, yeah the the largest is the first pin on the. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but um, yeah, the, the largest is our, our on the first pin on the, on the bottom image, um, and then we have a number of um, pilots you know, in and around Cancun, and the wave paddle itself was installed in Cozumel. And just last month, we installed um, some test equipment into the Isle of Man in the UK. And going forward, um, we are very late stage discussions with Israel, so I'm expecting a purchase order from them actually in the next couple of days. 
and that's to install a pilot system with them. And we're also in working with um, Terror Army in the Indian Ocean um, with on the, the Adaman Islands, um, where we're aiming to install a, a large scale um, pilot reef as well. And alongside that, um, back in the in the Yucatan, we've got a number of other projects which are marked out in these all orange uh, um, pins, both with hotels and also with um, developers. So overall in the Yucatan, we have about uh, an extra kilometre of, of reef. Um, yeah, it, it, quite serious letters of intent, as in they are developers who have expressed an interest in doing this, but they've also um, spent tens of thousands of pounds with us, both doing the design and the surveying and obtaining permits. So at the moment, we're just waiting on permits from the federal authorities, and then those projects will hopefully pro progress. The Telcheck Reef is is our largest. It's the the it's 120 meters long. Um, it's on the uh, northern it was on the northern tip of the Yucatan. Um, it is. Um, it was our sort of first big scale project, and when we went into this, it was actually the 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 test for us was how effectively can we deploy something at this scale, and we've we've opted on the whole to try to ensure that we can install these things fairly manually. Um, very often, getting access to the coastline is is not easy, so. Um, being able to bring in large boats or diggers and stuff is not necessarily a given. So we were able to actually install this entire system um, by lifting all of the units into position. Each unit, for example, only weighs about 65 kilos, so it's a two-man lift. Um, it's a big two-man lift, but it's you know, it's very manageable. And once you get things into the water, it becomes a lot easier. And we ultimately ended up in um, constructing all of these things on the shore, and we were then roll them into the sea and um, just pull them pull them into into location so we're when we two years ago i would have said this was our biggest risk it's now our least um riskiest element um we've learned a huge amount and we're really comfortable with the the, the approach that we have in terms of installation um this is um, probably our our best performing reef it's a very small structure but it's in the royal resorts in in um, it's outside the, the Royal Resorts Hotel in Mexico, so they 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 commissioned this this project. So at the end of this pier, um, actually below it, we've installed um, one of these one of our units, and this is a, a pilot unit. So we we've used a, a combination of a sort of mesh and bar structure to see how they they before perform. And after four months, we are getting to the point where we've actually started to close up the holes in, in the, the mesh that you can see on the left hand side here. Um, the other great feature about this is we've seen a huge number of fish around that structure. Um, so it's it's clear and, and I don't take any major sort of um, I don't you know we haven't done anything major in, in that regard. Um, if you, sorry, reiterate that, if you put a, a supermarket trolley in the ocean, you would attract fish. We were, by putting our structure in the ocean, we're attracting fish to that. Um, but what we want to be doing as we go forward is, is, is to en enhance enhance that um, attractiveness for the, for the reef. And I'll explain in a second how that's done. And then finally, although this is the first thing we actually did, uh, we've had our pilot reef, um, so my internet cut out for a second. Um, we've had our pilot reef installed in Cozumel. Um, that was installed back in August of 2018, and we took it back out again in about March 2019. So going forward, um, just to sort of touch on you know, where, where I see the company going, um, we're actually raising crowdfunding right now. So if you, if you actually go to our website, you can link through to um, um, our, our crowdfunding which literally just started yesterday but and, and that that new investment that we're looking for is to help drive not only the development of the wave paddle but also to develop the you know the 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 technologies around um, the reef and we see it being very much technology led and as I said we've got this digital reef concept and we want to move it into the sort of living reef reef sort of arena so we start with um, around what we want to do around corals and oysters you know we're, so we're now actually developing a hatchery um, the other piece that we have seen and this is sort of an, uh, uh, 
as a result of watching what's going on in our reefs. We've seen an awful lot of calcareous organisms growing on our structure. And if we can encourage them, then they actually can take over the job that we, we ourselves are trying to do so they can they can complement in, in a way what we're doing. Um, fish are vitally important for the, the marine ecosystem. Um, not only do they eat algae off of corals and keep those healthy, but they also provide um, nutrients um, for 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 the next thing, which is seagrass. And for those who don't know, seagrass is is ex, is a phenomenal um, plant. Not a, it's reckoned to be 35 to 50 times more effective than the rainforest at removing CO2. Um, studies have also shown that it helps to remove microplastics from the ocean that, that in turn help to keep corals healthy. Um, and also seagrass, and from our perspective from coastal protection, um, seagrass stabilizes the sand, so they help to stabilize beaches. And the final part to that is is you know around people. We know what are we we we've got to enhance our interaction with the local communities and the people who are you know who use the seas for their living, but also um, um, interact with nature. You know, f from everything from discouraging tourists from using the wrong sunscreen to um, encouraging fishermen to look after these reefs and not to fish directly around them, but to, to rather, you know, make these into marine protected zones. OK, and we see, as I said, technology and the development of sensors to monitor everything of, around this um, coming on. So just to very briefly sort of summarize, well, you know, summarize this, you know, this is work we're doing with with um, uh, primarily in a pesca. Um, so this is their tanks where they're, they're growing corals with fragments and we want to be taking those fragments and taking them out onto our reef. The, the reef itself becomes effectively like a, an enhanced nursery. It's the electrolysis actually helps these um, corals to grow, but you can't just place corals on sand that they need a structure. So, you know, the, the, the reef after three or four months can give them that. It gives them a, you know, a really solid bedrock on, upon which to be placed and away we go. I mentioned the you know the calcareous organisms. This is just a, it's a fairly poor picture, but we noticed in certain areas we were getting a lot more um, organisms um, building up and and with quite large sort of volumes. And as I said, it's really that's really helpful to us because it means we don't have to put quite so much power into the into the structures. So we want to look at ways to enhance that, and we think it relates to sort of the the surface finish um, of of the reef and how, how that's working. Um, we are still in, you know, we, we, I'd say we're still in negotiations, but we, you know, we've negotiated what we want to do with Cornell University. We're just waiting for that legal department to sign the paperwork, but we are about to start work with Cornell University on um, linking in their acoustics. So they've done some incredible work where they have shown that if you play the right sounds to, if you play the sound of a healthy reef in an area where the corals have died, you can actually attract fish to that to that region and that's what this, this top graph is showing um, and we want to essentially use that same same technique to ensure what to first of all listen to what the signature of a healthy reef sounds like so we can try to make sure that our own reefs take have that same sort of sound signature but also to use acoustics to monitor the health of the ecosystem I mean by listening you can hear different fish you can hear like um, snapping shrimps etc and um, sound has the advantage that you're not reliant on light so you, or the turbidity of the water is not going to have an impact. Um, whereas if you're using um, visual visual sort of sensors like cameras, you are, you are you know very much dependent on on what's going on. So we want to be also putting in cameras, but using working alongside Cornell University to see if we can actually build up an almost like a, a catalog of what sounds are coming from what creatures and what quantity of um, fish or other organisms are there based on the sound the sound signatures or the volume of sound we're hearing and at the same time using some of the acoustic stuff to um, playing that sound back in the ocean to attract certain fish and perhaps even detract others and for them of course we've got this 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 platform that essentially becomes a scientific um sort of um um yeah, it becomes a scientific platform on which they can put sensors every five meters if they wish along kilometers of coastline. Um, 
I mentioned seagrass. As I said, I'm not going to say any more about this, but we don't we haven't done anything in the seagrass area, but we are actively working or looking forward and just in discussions with a number of sort of marine biologists in this area. And we want to see how we can bring these in, in and around the reef as, as fast as possible. And finally, um, the people interaction. Um, we've done a certain amount of certain amount of work in this area, um, but I certainly want to get get more engaged um, at both a local level and also you know, with schools, say in the UK, in trying to um, promote understanding of our oceans. And the reason we're going after schools in many cases is that they go home and they tell their parents. And then the next level up from that is, you know, you have your town hall meetings and you can hopefully then encourage more people to come because they've heard through their kids about what we're doing. And all the way through to when when we installing projects in hotels, can we get can we play videos on the on the hotel um, you know in in the, in the, in the TVs and in, in the hotel rooms? We can present videos of what we're doing. We can even have live feeds coming from the reef itself. But working with the hotels to build in sort of environmental ecological programs that may involve the tourists going to help plant the corals even going to the local ha coral hatcheries and helping to you know, see what's going on and support that work um, but all the way through to thinking about um, you know their impact on the environment well we're going to run a bit that's out it. of time that's great i was going to say we're running out of time um thank you very much will uh there's a lot there was a lot there um, and there were a few things that I wasn't expecting. So um, I would like to ask if anyone has any questions. I'm sure Dan Millison might have a statement or Nick, uh, you want to follow up with anything, but uh, please raise your hand and I'll I'll kick off. Scott, go ahead. Yeah, that was a great presentation. And I, I love the last part about integrating sound um, to attract uh, organisms looking to make a home on a healthy reef. Um, one of the couple questions I had, one is about the, have you done any research about the changes in water chemistry due to electric mineral accretion, specifically higher alkalinity and higher oxygen content? And what are the implications for large scale projects on overall water quality improvements? Um, so around the reef itself, um, I didn't ex explain how the actual mineral accretion works, but effectively you are changing, you're increasing the pH around the structure. So the the it moves by about two, two points on the sort of the pH scale. So the water is actually slightly more alkaline um, than it would otherwise be, which in arguably helps to offset sort of ocean acidification. But remember that's only a, a localized effect and actually around the anode, we think we're increasing the water is actually more acidic. So overall it's it's fairly neutral. Um, but the crucial thing for us is, well, there's two crucial things for that. First of all, the anode remains nice and clean. Um, so the anode is where we're putting power in. The cathode is the structure itself where the rock's growing. Um, and the around the cathode, we've, you know, we've lowered the pH, which benefits um, oysters and, and other, other organisms. And just to explain in, in a nutshell how the, the rock accretion works, if you think about your kettle, um, I don't know, you know, if you if you when you boil water in your kettle calcium and other minerals are more soluble in cold water than they are in warm so when you boil your kettle those minerals actually settle out and that's what forms the lime scale <coughs> you see in your in your kit in your kitchen kettle or in your saucepans um, we're doing essentially the same thing but instead of changing the temperature we're just changing the ph which causes those minerals then to crystallize out um, in terms of oxygen content we are producing bubbles of hydrogen actually around the uh, the cathode, but you are seeing bubbles of oxygen coming off of the um, the anode. Um, I don't know enough. I mean, clearly the oxygen will help to enrich and oxygenate the water. Um, I don't believe it's probably on a scale that's going to have much of an impact in terms of removing pollutants, etc. But um, it certainly nudges it in the right direction. And do you think that the um, the is there any been studies on how to capture that hydrogen and maybe use it for some cooking gas or other kind of uh, um, functional use? Yeah, I we 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 considered that very early on. I mean, it, it's it's very tempting because you're right. I mean, we that we we're producing hydrogen and it's just been wasted. And it would be great if you could actually somehow collect that. The the problem is it's it's being produced. You know you've got these like micro bubbles um, forming across the entire structure, and when you when you go and look at it, you know some of those 
those tiny little bubbles come together and eventually form a big enough bubble and then then they're actually visible but prior to that they're, they're you know sort of spread across the structure um it would be very it'd be very I, I don't know how you I mean you could obviously put sort of a funnel above the reef but you you'd have to think quite imaginatively about how you could collect it um without sort of creating a, a huge eyesore um and and or just smothering the reef itself so I'd love to, but I don't know if it's possible. But what is interesting is what we're doing um, in terms of um, the design of the, the anodes and the materials we're using to design those. Um, we're going to be doing some work with Bath University and they are looking to use essentially the same, you know, we, we're, we're working on some new stuff together. We're trying to optimize the rock growth. They're trying to use the same approach to optimize um, the generation of hydrogen in, in salt water, so in seawater. Great. My last question really quick. I know a lot of people probably want to ask questions that is quickly about refraction and instead of placing them, you know, equidistance on a shoreline, for example, why not put them in a line or a, a diamond or arrow point kind of shape where the wave energy is increased along the line. So you're pulling more wave energy to the uh, the uh, wave refracting devices that are again in alignment instead of spread out in a parallel to the shoreline. Yeah. Um, again, really good idea. Uh, we we actually were um, party to a, a group up in Strathclyde who were suggesting exactly that. So you you know by very smartly placing your reefs, you could using using refraction to actually focus energy um, towards the wave energy to, uh, collector. So the idea was that you know you could increase the the waveness of in one area. But at the same time, reduce the amount of waves in the never area. Um, absolutely. I mean, you, you can do that. Um, for our current purposes, of the, of course, we're just trying to reduce the amount of energy everywhere. So we haven't, we haven't. Um, and I think also you would need to have a reef which is fairly deep in. You know, you couldn't have just a single line or a double line as we're we're doing. You'd probably have to have a, a number of, of reefs going further out to sea to cause the diffraction across quite a. a a distance to the point that you wanted um but yeah it's it, it's certainly possible great thank thank you great answers gary you had a question uh steve yes thank you uh will fantastic presentation thank you very much i'm intrigued to know you spoke about how uh, relatively easy it is to maneuver and position the reefs uh in in the water from the beach it's just more how, how are you securing them fixing them to the seabed to ensure that they're not going to move in heavy seas and storms etc so we we that was probably the biggest single challenge we had um going in two years ago and in the sense of how do we actually anchor these and we spent uh, a lot of time and money investing in various tools and different anchors designs um, and we were trying to screw these down in i mean we we, we the tail check reef is it, that's their sand anchors that we're holding it into so the sand anchor is essentially uh, a sort of I mean, a bit like this um, so i don't know if you guys can see my camera so you've got like a big disc and then you've got a you've got a, a so I'm just finding a pen and then you've got a, a, a bar that comes off the top and you you sink this into the sand. Um, the traditional approach of getting those in is to sort of screw them in. And when we when we started, everyone was saying to us, you know, it will take between 40 minutes and two hours just to put a single anchor, anchor in. What we now do is we when we install the reef, the, the anchors actually sit outwards a bit like a sort of spider you know so you think about a centipede or something like that so you have you look at the structure from above and you've got all these anchors just sitting out sideways we then come along and aerate the, the sand around the the anchors and they swing down um into position now that does mean we leave a series of holes along along the along either side of the reef but within about two days the sand actually just backfills and it's it's perfectly okay and and the great thing is it's yeah it's fast so we can get an anchor in in about five minutes now Correct. Thank you very much. Intriguing. Um, the other side of that, obviously, is if we were installing onto areas where it's very shallow sand, then we would use rock, rock bolts. Still need to do some more work on that. So if anyone's got any really good ideas on how to install rock bolts really fast, um, I'd be very interested. Um, we are working a little bit with Gripple, as a UK company, and that's the, they have the intention of, of firing um, um that's kind of like an arrow that goes into the into the rock and then it um twists to sort of stop it from pulling out but we we've yet to sort of fully test that 
Will, you mentioned, um, sorry, Nick, I'm going to jump in on you for two secs. You mentioned uh, saltwater hydrogen. Can you talk a little bit more about that or just very briefly what you know, just 30, 40 seconds? Um, there's not much I <laughs> can add to be honest. I mean, the, the, when, when, you, when we're doing our electrolysis, you, you want, once you go above 1.2 volts, that you're putting, I mean, we're putting a very low voltage into the system. <laughs> once you go above about 1.2 volts, you then start to create hydrogen. And it's actually really important to us because we, these little hydrogen bubbles that are coming off the steel, um, create, um, pores through the rock, which allow, which, and, the, and is those pores allow the electrical current to continue to flow. If you don't do that, you actually end up closing up the rock and it, you actually end up insulating the system that you're trying to put power into. Um, now, when when what so what we're the, 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 the work around that is really around the, the anode. So the anodes um, traditionally made of, of titanium and then they have a sort of mineral coating placed onto that. Now we're we're starting to look at a variety of other sort of, you know, the the moment we have a, a mesh type of anode um, we're moving into looking at using sort of rods but it's also whether or not you can create an anode without using titanium because it's it's not a rare earth metal but it's a it's not a it's a relatively expensive metal um and it also so, has limited supply yeah limited supply is yeah that's probably the better word yeah, yeah. so um yeah so we, we we are just looking at how we can optimize the design of the anode to um, um, yeah, effectively avoid the use of titanium, but also avoid some of the, you know, when the mineral coating itself um, does contain some sort of rare, I think oh, I've got the name right, molybdenum or something, you know, so certainly some rare earth metals. And they're only very, very small trace elements, but, you know, do they actually need to be there and do they actually enhance the growth of, of, of um, enhance the process? The other aspect of what we find we, we create small traces of, of chlorine, which in the ocean is not an issue. I mean, if anything, it probably is actually helping against pollution and stuff. But in in the lab, it's a bit of annoying because you know over time that chlorine glass leaks out, and as you know, chlorine is is poisonous. But um, there are by changing the the mineral coating on the anodes, you can change the the properties of it and change what chemical reactions are favoured, and as, as, as I was saying earlier, you know, we, we, we want to create these sort of brucites, we want um, an, an, an aragonite, and what can we do at a, at a sort of a, at a mineral coating level to optimise that? Okay, and, and Nick, you're our, next. Sorry. Thanks, great presentation, Will. I I've, I've just love the tech, and I've already um, just put some feelers out on rock bolts, because we know a, a company that's been working on interesting um, seabed securing the uh, technologies um awesome. Thank you. you you and i talked a little bit about sargassum and the big problem of sargassum in the caribbean and mexico in particular uh, a couple of days ago could you just touch on how how the how you, your technology or your approach to reefs can be considered in, in that context uh, for, for sargassum catching and so on okay so so for those who don't know what sargassum sar sargassum is not to be confused with sarcasm um, it's seaweed that um, forms in the sargasm sea in, in the Caribbean and it is a huge huge problem so most of the hotels that we approach um, when we talk about the issues they have on their beaches number one actually is um, the sargasm and when it's very hard to describe but imagine um, your mattress um, on your bed um, of just solid seaweed rocking up on on a beach and it's literally going out to sort of two three hundred meters out to sea um they are in many of the hotels are literally they're sending people down they are digging out multiple um i mean i think one of them was to, taking out 18 trucks per day of seaweed and they've got people just lifting this off they don't want to use mechanical machines too much because they end up taking an awful lot of sand out uh, away as well and as we've been discussing the, the the loss of sand is also a big issue now um so nick and i were talking about the other day about how we how we might um, um support the development or, or uh, so support the work on that now fortunately we actually have a partner axis um, ima in, in mexico and they have a, a sister company that is that has 
has um, put together a number of boats and they are they have a sort of conveyor belt system on the front and they can drive up and down and um, lift the sarcasm off before it reaches the, sh the shore so the 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 piece that goes alongside that is and the hotels are already doing this is putting in um, barriers so they're they are they're sort of a, a floating um, membrane that has a that sinks about about I think it's about half a meter into the water um, and the idea is that, that as the seaweed floats along the surface it comes up against this these sort of almost like swimming lane um, um, floats and is stopped at that point and then as long as you don't allow too much to build up i.e. by having your ships going up and down taking it out you can um, prevent it from coming to shore you will always get some coming to shore um, that's just inevitable because um, but it greatly reduces the the, the risk to the, the direct beach now what where we think we can probably help with that is not only just with the connections but um, if we through using the same anchoring techniques that we're using for our reefs and possibly even um, the reefs themselves the, the this this floating um, sargassum barrier can actually be attached either to the reef or to a set of anchors that are further afield. And as I said, when we came into this and what the industry currently do is they screw these anchors down. Um, we think we can do that much, much better. And um, yeah, I think there's an opportunity when we're installing a reef to also to be installing um, a set of uh, um, anchor points for these barriers. I could carry on talking all morning about this, uh, <laughs> Steve, but I think uh, we're probably getting towards the end of time. Do you, do you, have you got any more questions? Um, I think we've run out of time for questions, Nick. I think uh, it's a real pity because we, we probably could kick on about this for a while because um, there's uh, a few things come to mind, notably a uh, uh, an aquaculture, offshore aquaculture business could probably be linked to this as well and actually be yeah. reinforced by it. So there's there's a whole bunch of moving parts um, and this is an enabling infrastructure. So, um, Will, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, there's a few things that have come up. Uh, Cindy Cisneros Tianco um, has suggested there might be a pilot site and we actually have some funding through the energy group at SDCC to support that. So we'll look at that. We're very keen to carry forward the discussions and um, thank you so much. And uh, this recording will be available on the data room in probably about 24 hours. So thank you, everybody. And thanks, Will. Lovely to meet you. And we'll see We'll see you very soon, I think. Well, okay. Thank you, everybody, for, for listening in. Sorry, I went over slightly over time. I'm actually, I'm actually happy to stay online for, for you know, another 10 minutes if, if people want, want to, to ask me anything. Cool. Um, but um, yeah, okay. but otherwise. I, I, we might do that and I'll, I'll turn off the recording now. Thank you everyone.